Thank you very much, Joe. Joe has been uh, at several points during the day today, very effusive and uh, great, expressed his gratitude to me. But um, I really uh, want to tell everybody the truth, which is that there are a number of other people who deserve a lot more credit than I do for the curriculum that we're about to announce. And first among all of them is Joe Chiani, because at that first meeting less than two years ago, um, I was not at that time very much involved in patient safety, and it was Joe's passion and the compelling case that he made that really, uh, and we agreed on everything. It just, it, there was just no way to do anything other than to take this on. Uh, it's not as if I don't have a day job. But, um, but it's, been, it's been very uh, exciting, and it would not be happening without you, Joe. Um, there are uh, people in the audience who contributed significantly to this through their role on the, the working group, which met um, uh, in person uh, three or four times in various uh, 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 places, uh, and, um, and met by phone every other week for the last year and a half. Uh, a year ago, when we were in London and I uh, expressed the progress we were making, I really just basically described the concept that we were still shaping. And I will confess that standing at the podium at that time, I was nervous that one year was not going to be enough for us to be able to produce something that we'd be proud of. But I can tell you that it is with great pleasure and pride that I'm um, describing the curriculum that we are launching today. And so I'm very grateful to people uh, in the audience, such as Steve Barker, and Alicia Cole, who has been an inspiration to the group. Lee Fleischer, Ron Jordan, uh, Phil Greiner, as well as Ariana and Michelle uh, from, the <clears throat> from the foundation. But I think all of them would agree that we would not have a product that is in such good shape uh, to announce today uh, if it weren't for my co-chair in this group, Dr. Peggy Shoemaker, uh, who also uh, is the chair of a working group that I formed at Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine to create a patient safety curriculum within our uh, medical school. Uh, and so Peggy is sitting somewhere over there, uh, and, uh, and she deserves uh, certainly more credit than I do for what we're, uh, what we're about to announce. So uh, the uh, charge that uh, we gave to the, to the committee was not to reproduce the uh, curricula, some of them really wonderful curricula in patient safety that are already out there from um, organizations like the Institute, Institute for Healthcare Improvement or the World Health Organization or professional societies that have got uh, components of patient safety built into their curricula and certainly uh, a nursing profession uh, leads the way on this. Uh, but what Joe was so concerned about was that these have not moved the needle in health professions education. They have not been widely adopted. And our goal was to create a curriculum that's adaptable, adaptable to clinical learners across the spectrum of professional maturity from novice to expert, and across all health professions. And so, for example, the AAMC, the Association of American Medical Colleges, with whom I've been in touch about our curriculum, uh, is uh, creating uh, a set of competencies to define requirements upon graduation from medical school. One point in the, in the professional continuum of one profession. Ours is much more ambitious. It also, uh, at its core, emphasizes the benefits of team-based interprofessional care, and very importantly, and consistently with the core values of this foundation, which I think makes this foundation so successful in pursuit of its goals, is the centrality of the patient voice and the family voice in the experience that the patient gets in healthcare. Making the patient not somebody that the professionals value as they take care of the passive patient, but making the patient an active participant in their own care and respecting that role. Alicia's story and so many other stories that we've heard tell us that when that does not happen, the patient suffers. And so that is a central component of, the, of this curriculum. And so the virtues of the curriculum that we're so proud of uh, is, that the, is, is in the structure and the adaptability of what we've created. So the content is largely not new. It is content that is pulled from other places. We have created content. But the modularity allows 
instructors and professors and, uh, uh, and teachers to look at their own curricula, identify what they're already teaching, identify what's missing, use our framework of, uh, of domains and competencies as a guide to what's important to teach, and then choose from the material that we identify the, ma the material that is appropriate for that level of learner, appropriate to that profession, uh, and so the people can choose to use our, uh, our material in a modular way. It's suitable for a variety of teaching strategies, whether it's in the old-fashioned way of talking at people, which I'm doing to you right now, or um, the more, um, uh, any of the uh, more recently adopted and very popular and successful methods of active uh, learning, uh, su suitable for the clinical setting, for teaching uh, in the clinical setting as well. It's conducive to delivery by people who may not be experts in patient safety, uh, but as long as they care about it and they understand the material, uh, they can use our material uh, to, to, um, to lead uh, education for those learners. It's practical in terms of time requirements because it's modular and adaptable, and so the facilitators and teachers can adapt it to the setting. Um, it's got many experiential components, uh, and, uh, and we use, as I will describe in a few minutes, a wide range of resources to support uh, the educational content. And I want to emphasize that as with, in my view, everything else, uh, in medical education and health professional education. Yes, it's important to teach knowledge, and yes, it's important to teach skills. But that is far from the whole, the entire goal of education. My view of education in a medical school, and I think it's true for all health professions, is that we are forming the professional identity of these future caregivers. And their professional identity has to include, as a fundamental component, Ownership for their role in the successful outcome on behalf of their patients. Ownership for their responsibility of the patient experience. And that is something, that is a value that is in uh, this curriculum. And so I'm going to describe very briefly what is described more fully in the 70-page document that is now live online and that will soon be available to you in hard copy as well. Um, the structure of what we have created. So uh, the overlying structure is the identification of eight fundamental domains of patient safety. I'll go through them. These domains overlap quite a bit with the domains in the curricula from the IHI and the WHO that are already out there. Many of them are the same. And these should not be viewed as discrete siloed domains in which the, con the content is separate in each of these domains. The content very much overlaps. And so in one sense, you could say that the definition of these domains is arbitrary, and we would probably acknowledge that. But I think it's very important to acknowledge that every single one of them is critical to patient safety. And so we've identified four of these domains as foundational to everything else, and those are error science, system science, human factors, and technology. Two of these domains are linking domains that link everything else, and those are teamwork and communication, and it's hard to overemphasize the importance of that one, and I'm very grateful to Annegret Hanoa, who has helped the work, the, who spoke last year on the panel uh, in London, and who was help, very helpful to the team uh, and the communi communication uh, curriculum. And leadership and leading change, those are the two linking uh, domains. And then two domains we are labeling as aspirational domains. Aspirational doesn't mean we don't think we'll ever get there. Aspirational means that these are are, the, are, are trans, transformatively important in this curriculum, and that is a culture of safety and patient-oriented safe care. So I am, uh, uh, I'd like to, um, if you want to read the definition of these domains with the, which the group worked on for each one of them, um, they're in the 70-page in the, uh, document. I would encourage you to read them. Um, but I will, uh, I will start by just reading two of them. The culture of safety, the two that I said are aspirational. The culture of so safety is a domain that identifies an ideal culture as one that would promote patient safety. 
addressing elements of organizational culture, professionalism, ethics, disclosure, and an effective learning system. And I need to emphasize that a curriculum alone is not going to get us there because we know that in education, in any setting, what is so important is what the learner sees modeled by their role models and sees practiced in the setting in which they learn. And so if we don't actually have a culture of safety in our clinical setting, then teaching a culture of safety is only one component of getting there. And so the goals, the overarching goals of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation are all mutually interdependent. Patient-oriented safe care is a domain that is devoted to patients and families navigating healthcare with attention to, rel to relationship-centered communication, engagement of the patient and family as valued team members, and appreciation of safe care from the, pa from the recipient's perspective. So we think these are all fundamentally important. This is the framework. These eight domains are the overlying framework for the curriculum as a whole. And then within each domain, uh, there, there is a structure. And so what I'm going to describe first is the modular design, and then I'll take you through just one example. So for each domain, we have at the beginning of that part of the curriculum a definition of that domain. I just read you two of them. And a sticky note. It, it isn't actually physically a sticky note, but it really looks like one. And that sticky note links that domain with national patient safety goals. And I'll give you an example of that. And then with each, 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 within each domain, there are subdomains that are more specific. And within each subdomain, there are learning objectives. And then for each learning objective, there are examples, multiple examples, of how you demonstrate competency for that objective. And so I'll give you an example of that, and we'll talk about how people can then use this curriculum. So we'll take as, as an example of one domain, the very important domain of teamwork and communication. This domain, and this is the, it starts with the definition of the domain, and here is the sticky note linking it to Joint Commission National Patient Safety Goals of uh, communicate medication information, teamwork training, et cetera. So this domain of teamwork and communication addresses the concept of teams in healthcare delivery and emphasizes the knowledge, attributes, skills, and behaviors required of effective teams to deliver safe care. Error-prone gaps in care are highlighted with content offering validated communication frameworks to ensure patients' safe transitions across the healthcare experience. And so if we look at the subdomains within teamwork and communication, those domains are teams and healthcare, handoffs and gaps, team steps, and within each of those subdomains, I'll give you an example of just one learning objective. So the learning objective for teams in healthcare, a learning objective, is to, for example, recognize if you're a novice, there's a, the developmental verb is different depending on the stage of development. So to recognize the benefits of effective interprofessional teams and their role in patient safety. And depending on your level of maturity along the spectrum, you might recognize, you might articulate, you might value, you might model, and for an expert, you would teach that. And then each of those is linked with resources, and there's a wide range of resources, and they're taken from multiple sources. Uh, they include role play materials to help facilitators establish a uh, scenario in a small group setting where people play different roles and, uh, and enact scenarios uh, uh, that, that emphasize points regarding safety. Um, there are uh, videos and, of course, stories. Stories have been important in every presentation that I've ever attended of the Patient Safety Movement Foundation and they are so critical in effective teaching. And so we've built stories throughout this curriculum, in videos, in examples of cases. Local experiences can be brought in uh, for group discussion. We, we have multiple links to online resources and materials for didactics, some of which are taken from things you may remember, those of you who are as old as I am, called textbooks. Um, we use that too. We are very ecumenical in this. 
um, and supplemental readings, all sorts of resources. And so here's an example of, well, I've essentially already described this. A novice would be expected to demonstrate competency in the learning of this subdomain learning objective, recognize the benefits of inter effective interprofessional teams and their role in patient safety. An advanced beginner would be able to articulate those benefits. A competent learner uh, would value the benefits of effective interprofessional teams and their roles in patient safety. That might, for example, be a resident in the hospital setting. Somebody who's proficient would model those benefits. That would be somebody who's finished residency training and is now practicing. And an expert is somebody who's mature in their practice uh, skills who would be expected to teach the role of effective interprofessional teams. And so the cover page of our curriculum calls it a patient safety curriculum in schools. I think this is the only example I can think of, Joe, where you've been not sufficiently ambitious in your goals. So I think we should change the title. The patient safety curriculum for all health professionals, no matter how mature they are. So how would, how would a novice who needs to recognize the benefits of effective interprofessional teams demonstrate that competency? So we give a number of ways that the teacher can choose to have the learner demonstrate that. They could, um, after a discussion of case studies, they can expect that the student will be able to identify the benefits of interprofessional teams. Or after a didactic session, a student should be able to list the essential characteristics of highly, highly functioning interprofessional teams. Or following a didactic session, the student can list the benefits of, uh, of interprofessional teams that includes the patient family voice, um, uh, etc. So you, you get the idea. Multiple ways that, a, that the teacher can, um, can choose to have a student demonstrate competency. Multiple sources of resources for the facilitators. So we have videos and patient stories that are, some of which are on YouTube, some of which are on various websites, uh, uh, and uh, what they all have in common is that they are all compelling. Real life experiences that are built into case examples and role play uh, 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 sessions. Um, online resources, a wide range of online resources that include links to websites. A wide range of materials for didactics and supplemental readings. Uh, materials for role play, which include scripts and, uh, or, or a description of each role and the responsibilities in the exercise. And you've got 20 minutes to imagine you're the patient and you're the nurse and, uh, and uh, and et cetera, uh, and to enact scenarios. Uh, and of course, supplemental readings, and for those of you who don't recognize it, those lower right-hand corner, are, it's a stack of books. So, this is not, the, the idea is to, is to make this as easy as possible, as user-friendly as possible to implement. So how will you all implement this? That's, I'm not using the subjunctive mode. I'm using, I'm simply describing what you will all do. First, go back to your setting, whether that is a school or a clinic or a hospital or a, uh, a, a, a tech company uh, or an insurance company, um, and look at the content of what, you've, what you're already doing. You're all doing education one way or another. Look at that content and see what's in there that's already patient safety. It may not be consciously labeled as patient safety, but see whether it is. Line that up with our competencies, domains, and subdomains and see where the gaps are. And then you've got to get commitment from the people who are responsible for professional development in your organization to do this, but choose material that's appropriate from this wide range of material in the curriculum that will fill those gaps. And, and the third point is that faculty development is very important because you need to orient the faculty to the goals of the curriculum and how to use the curriculum. So you can start small. 
um, and integrate it into your existing and developing uh, curricula. And so um, I'm going to linger on this slide with this behind me to describe to you what we are doing at the Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine to do just this. So first of all, Joe, you didn't, I haven't had a chance to tell you this, but in the last few months, Geisinger has been in the process of, a strategi of strategic planning for the entire Geisinger system, which, to put it in context, is about half the size of partners we heard about earlier. Um, and the values of that system have been learning, innovation, kindness, and excellence. And those have been the mantra for the last several years. Two months ago, Geisinger agreed to add a fifth value, a fifth fundamental value to everything that happens at Geisinger, which is quality and safety. And Neil Martin, the chief quality officer who's been to these meetings, is in the center of that. And so at Geisinger's medical school, the Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine, as I've mentioned, Peggy Shoemaker, once again, who co-chaired this task force, chairs our medical school's task force. And so what she has already done is to meet with course directors, uh, people who run the various uh, components of the curriculum throughout the four years, um, to identify the gaps in the curriculum, to map it against our, uh, our curriculum, to identify uh, those gaps, and to choose material to fill those gaps, just as I've, uh, as I've said in the, in the first bullet here. Um, and that is already beginning to happen this spring. Uh, the course directors uh, are on board with this, they're excited about this, uh, and they're working with Peggy to identify the content and identify the right places throughout the four years of the curriculum to fit it in. But we are not limiting ourselves to the undergraduate medical uh, experience. I am uh, the dean of the medical school. I'm also the chief academic officer of the Geisinger system. So all of Geisinger's residency programs come under me. All of Geisinger's educational programs in all the health professions come under me as chief academic officer. And the people who lead those efforts, uh, several of them, have been on this task force. So our our Associate Dean for Graduate Medical Education uh, is on this task force and listed in the book. Uh, our Associate Dean for Continuing Professional Development has been on the task force. And so they are working with the residency program directors to offer the curriculum, now that we, as of today, can actually give them the curriculum. Um, uh, and they've got buy-in from the residency program directors to look at their residency curricula. We have 56 residency and fellowship programs. And my hope is that all of them will incorporate this content into the didactic curriculum for the residencies and fellowships to work this into the curricula for nursing students and for uh, pharmacy students, a wonderful pharmacy program, um, and, um, uh, and the continuing professional development of the 1,600 providers in the Geisinger system. And so, Joe, you didn't ask us to do that. You asked us to to think about schools, but we, uh, uh, we're thinking much more broadly than that. So, uh, so that is what we are doing, and that is the challenge to you. We expect you to look at this curriculum, to go back and, uh, and examine what you're already doing in patient safety, because I bet you're all doing something, uh, and to uh, incorporate this to the extent you possibly can on behalf of our patients and keeping in mind that the goal of this curriculum is not merely to impart knowledge and to get people to know what they need to do, but for them to take ownership as part of their identity, their moral obligation to their patients, that they need to do this. And it is our obligation that we need to, to inspire them to do this. And so with that, I'll yield the rest of my time to Joe. Sure. I'd like you to share with the audience of your recent interactions with both the medical school staff and the hospital staff, and as you've told them about this curriculum and how they've reacted to it. Well, uh, our, we've, we have um, not brought it out widely to the staff as a whole. Um, uh, because uh, we, we can't give them the curriculum. We will do that now. But what I have done is I've presented this uh, to the Geisinger leadership. Uh, and they were 
Uh, I thought they'd be politely interested, and I was cer certainly expected the chief nursing officer and chief medical officer to be very interested, and of course they were. But every single executive vice president across the Geisinger system, uh, and there are 12 of them, uh, expressed great enthusiasm, and several of, of them contacted me throughout that day to tell me about how, for example, the chief scientific officer said, uh, I want to read that 70-page curriculum because I think there are going to be opportunities for our scientists to do research on patient safety. Wow. And our, we have a chief innovation officer who is the former Secretary of Health for the state of Pennsylvania who has said that she wants to use the curriculum to build nudges into Geisinger's, for, exa for example, electronic ordering system um, for providers. Uh, and uh, the CEO was very enthusiastic and um, was starting to strategize with me about how we get this person or that person to... Uh, so there's, there's a there's huge enthusiasm. Wow, thank you. And that's, that's what you should expect when you try to take this out to your institution. And thank you for your leadership, Steve. I know you had a wonderful group of people working hard behind the scenes with you. Um, this is not easy. You really have created the gold mine that hopefully will hardwire patient safety for generations to come. And this is not a finished product. It's a, this, is a, this is a living document. The group will continue meeting, probably not every other week, but, <laughs> um, but uh, because there will be new, uh, new content uh, continually appearing and we'll need to link it with domains. As technology advances, as we can do more for patients, there will be uh, uh, more competencies we'll want to define. Uh, and a very substantial challenge will be implementation. So I think we want to strategize about disseminating the, the news about this uh, and convincing professional societies to uh, utilize this. I think several of them are already interested. And uh, as the point's been made by several people, convincing licensing boards, including the LCME, but, but all the others, uh, to incorporate this content into their board exams. That's what will really uh, get it adapted. The work has just begun. Great. But thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Great work. Thank you. Thank you.